All right, welcome. Let's, uh, let's open our session this morning with prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, we pray that your spirit would be upon us this day. We pray for your guidance and your wisdom as we study your word. We thank you for Paul and the saints who went before us. Guide us this day in all that we do through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, let's get underway with week number nine. Remember, now we have jumped back to um, we have jumped to the beginning of Romans. So here we're going to be. Uh, I know that that may excite you to think, great, we're only doing two verses this week, but in fact, that is two chapters. Uh, we will be looking at Romans two and three today. So if you recall last week, uh, let's look at our, our little review here. Um, oh, well. So we got Paul's self-identity. Remember, we talked about the use of the word slave that often gets translated out of our modern uh, translations and turned into servant. So Paul identifies as a slave and as an apostle. Um, apostles in, in, uh, in Paul's uh, lexicon are people who were called directly by Jesus. So if you were called directly by Jesus, according to Paul, then you're an apostle. Uh, otherwise, you're more of a disciple. Um, Paul wants the Roman house churches to see him as a slave of the Messiah who was commissioned by the Lord Jesus. So this is Paul's self-identity. That should be ringing some bells, I hope. Um, Larry Price, he can come in. Um, then we get to this issue of shame. Remember, um, Paul said that he was not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, that very much tied into his uh, Roman identity. Uh, Paul not only was an observant Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen. And um, so that was that was part of, of who he who he was and how he saw himself, uh, the, the cross uh, would have been embarrassing to any Roman citizen. So for Paul to uh, say that he's not ashamed of the gospel uh, strikes at the very heart of his Roman identity. Um, okay, then uh, moving on a little bit, we get these gospel themes here at the very beginning. Most of what I'm touching on is in the very, the first 14 verses of chapter first one. Chapter it's before we get into the business of, uh, of uh, talking about the Gentiles. So the gospel saves, uh, faith engages us in redemption. Uh, in Romans, this is a key reminder, the opposite of faith is obedience to the Torah. So it's basically legalism is the opposite of faith. We could spend quite some time having a conversation about that. Uh, the gospel saves both Jews and Gentiles. There's no privilege uh, in being a Jew, according to Paul. And God's own righteousness is revealed as an attribute of God. So through Jesus, we see God's righteousness uh, as a divine attribute. Then, skipping ahead a little bit, uh, context, uh, Paul uh, indicts Gentiles as generic humanity, and then specifically the Jews, as, and that'll be this week, and very particular type of Jewish behavior is what he's getting after. I feel like I should give the, the, the reminder again, what Paul's talking about here are Jewish Christians. Passages like these and Paul's language about uh, Jewish folks, and certainly the gospel's language about Jewish folks, has been used for centuries by Christians to treat Jewish people poorly. Uh, that was not the intent, uh, and also at the time that these were written, uh, Jewish folks very much had the power, uh, and they were able to uh, successfully persecute Christians, so we should always hear this with a reminder of how poorly used language about Jewish people in Scripture has been by the church in the subsequent 1700 or so years. So it's difficult to talk about these sorts of things without making some sort of acknowledgement of the poor history that the church has of dealing with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, so uh, anyway, so we're going to talk mostly about Jewish folks today. Uh, divine handing over defines some of what wrath of God in 118 means. Uh, it refers to divine judgment on recalcitrant humans. Uh, as the wisdom of Solomon puts it, this is a good reminder, one is punished by the very things by which one sins. 
The Wisdom of Solomon is a book in the Apocrypha. It is not included in our Presbyterian Bible, although it's probably in quite a few of the Bibles you guys have at home. Uh, it is scripture for our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. Um, so anyway, and it, it appears to have heavily influenced Paul's thinking around Gentile uh, stereotypes of Gentiles that he uh, goes to here at the beginning of Romans. So uh, what he does in that 118 to 32 section is he kind of creates a, a, a stereotype of a typical sinner. We see that here. Paul describes not typical sins of typical sinners, but specific sins of a specific kind. Sir, he's not universalizing here. He's setting up the audience of Romans 2. So it's their stereotypes of what a sinner is, not what an actual sinner is. He's trying to trick them into thinking that he's going to join them in indicting the Gentiles, when in fact what he's going to do is um, correct them for their judgment, for being so judgy. He doesn't like that. So uh, any questions or, or comments here about last week? Did you think about anything um, before we jump ahead to this week? Okay, let's keep going. The judge, Romans 2, 17 to 29. If you recall the beginning of Romans 2, it's that very important verse. Therefore, I say to you, do not judge lest you be judged yourself. Uh, an important verse to remember after reading through the second half of chapter one, and it's a verse which is often forgotten. So now we're going to talk about this idea of the judge. So this is remembering we've got two groups, right, sitting in the Roman churches. Who do we have? We have the strong who are identified later in Romans. These are Gentile believers. These are people who do not come out of Judaism. These are Gentiles. And then we have the weak who are Jewish believers who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but also believe that that means we need to keep following the Torah, the rules of the Torah. So uh, the judge then is going to be those within that Jewish Christian population who believe themselves to be superior to Gentiles. Okay? So that's who's the audience here in Romans 2 and 3. So Romans 2, 6 through 11. <clears throat> for he will repay according to each one's deeds to those who by patiently doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality he will give eternal life while for those who are self-seeking and who obey not the truth but wickedness there will be wrath and fury there will be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil the jew first and also the greek but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good the jew first and also the greek Key line here at the end, for God shows no partiality. God shows no partiality. God's impartial judgment is the emphasis here. What matters for Paul, and this too is Judaism to the core, is lived theology. And what stuns the judge as he hears these words is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if one is a Jew or a Greek. What matters is deeds. The thematic statement is, for he will repay according to each one's deeds. And the conclusion is, for God shows no one partiality. Judgment by works is the mirror image of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. This is McKnight's argument. So at this point, by the way, we're deviating to some degree from orthodox Christian interpretation here. The latter without the former is not the grace of which Paul writes. What Paul says in Romans 2, 12 to 16, we already heard in Romans 14, 12, each of us will be accountable to God. With Phoebe's eyes on the judge, remember Phoebe, Phoebe is our reader here, the words ring loud and clear. Jew or Greek, what matters is not election or non-election, what matters is good and evil. So what are the fruits of your faith? That's the issue at stake here. What are the fruits? Do we want to let iPhone in? How do we feel about this? I don't know. I'm going to do it, but if it goes badly, blaming the rest <laughs> of you. Um, so judgment, we tend to think, how does salvation work? Just Salvation works by grace through faith. This is rooted in Romans. We also tend to think, that we aren't saved by works. That is what we do. 
What McKnight's arguing here is that there is an aspect of works that correlates to our salvation, but those works are not legalistic adherence to the Torah laws. Those works are rooted in the degree to which we do good with our lives. This gets back to that idea that the Gentiles had, they had within them, some of them, an innate sense of what was good and what was bad. And so therefore, when those Gentiles did what was good, they were faithful to God, even though they didn't know the Torah. And that there were Jewish folks who had the Torah and still did what was bad. We know this is true for anyone who's read like one page of the Old Testament. And so therefore, they failed, even though they had the Torah. God shows no partiality. So simply saying, I was raised as a Jewish person, I am ethnically Jewish, is not enough, Paul says, to assure anyone of salvation. What matters is the ways in which our faith manifests goodness in the world. So we are justified by grace through faith, and that justification leads to goodness. This goes back to that, remember the, the conversation several weeks ago of Christoform living, where lived theology is the key, living out our theology. If we believe God is good and then we behave poorly, that is not a good reflection on our theology. So there is a symbiotic relationship. That's what McKnight means here when he says judgment by works is the mirror image of salvation by grace alone through faith. He believes that there's a correlation Paul is trying to establish in Romans. He's not wrong. I mean, I, I don't think he knows it better than I do, but there would be quite a bit of challenges. Uh, he goes pretty far into the works argument, and I think that would get some pushback from traditional uh, theologians. So um, we're getting into fairly complicated things here. I think the takeaway for us, a couple of things, it does matter how we live our lives, but that it's not a rule-based thing. It's a goodness-based thing. And also, this is something I don't think we can think about enough uh, in our current world today, or really in any generation. God shows no partiality. Just in the same way that God was not partial to Jews or Greeks in Paul's day, insert whichever disparate groups you would like into that formula, and it still holds true. You can sort things out by race, by ethnicity, you can sort things out by gender, you can sort things out by political affiliation, you can sort things out by saying Texans versus the rest of the world. However you want to sort it out, God shows no partiality. And I think that's something that we love to go against. It's a manifestation of our sin that we believe God shows partiality to one group more than the other, and almost always the group that we think God is showing partiality to is which group? Us, right? We, we never said, no, I've never heard anybody come up to me and say, you know, Phil, doggone it, God's really biased in favor of those Southern Baptists. That is something that has never happened to me before. Okay, so questions about this before we keep going through chapter two? So an atheist that lives a good life, helps the poor, uh, you know, doesn't kick dogs and stuff like mm. that, they are still, uh, God is still impartial to them, correct? Uh, so here's the thing, right? So this is the, this is the mirror image. So if you think about it in this way, what McKnight would probably say to you is there's still faith in Jesus is still important. So instead of thinking about the atheist who does good, but doesn't have any faith, think about the person who has faith, but doesn't do anything good. Like that's probably the bigger thing that Paul is trying to get out, get out here. Remember, that was an era where there really weren't any atheists. That wasn't really a thing. But uh, pagans um, and those who had polytheistic uh, worldviews, that was definitely a thing. And so what uh, Paul is arguing here is that those people were doing good things without even knowing it, while on the other hand, you had Jewish folks who had the Torah and were still doing bad things. 
Remember, the audience here is not Gentiles. It is the judgmental Jewish Christians. So you have to put yourself in that position um, and, and kind of identify with them, I think, to get to the core of what he's trying to argue. In our day and age, uh, it's, it's more challenging. We think about secular people. We think about atheists. Um, and there's an interesting conversation, I think, to be had there, particularly in light of like Matthew 25. Uh, but by and large, I would say faith in Jesus is prerequisite for salvation. The important thing is not seeing that as an accomplishment or an achievement. Does that make sense? I heard what you said. <laughs> you want to keep talking about it? What, what do you? It, it doesn't matter if I say it if it doesn't make any sense. Phil, yeah. Uh, McKnight makes a statement in the text of that uh, what Paul is saying to non-believing Jews is not on these pages, mm -hmm. which suggests that he is exactly only preaching to Christian Jews, yes. not Jews right. otherwise. Right. He's only interested in Jewish Christians here. That's right. He's not in any way trying to get it. Jews. So this gets back to the idea of faith being the other side of this coin, right? Like faith in Jesus is the beginning point of this conversation. I think that would be the best answer that I could give to your question, Ken. Uh, from this perspective, faith in Jesus is the beginning of the conversation. Like, because as Greg said, uh, Jewish folks who didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah aren't part of Paul's thinking in this moment. These are people who are sitting in the church next to Gentiles and thinking that they are superior to those Gentiles. Does that help? I'm good with moving on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Before we move on, maybe uh, my answer was poor enough to make sure that nobody asks any further questions. <laughs> it's always something my I son used to do that with mowing the yard. What'd you say? My son used to do that kind of thing with mowing the yard. He did such a poor job, I wouldn't let him do it again. Right. You know, that's kind of what I'm up to here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's look at Romans 2 17 to 24. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast of your relation to God and know his will, and determine what is best because you are instructed in the law. And if you are sure that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then that teach others, here comes the dagger, will you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You that forbid adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhor idols, do you rob temples? You that boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You are behaving like hypocrites, the rhetorical trap for the judge. These are things, so I tried to read that in a way to where you could get the irony of the first part of the passage. Um, always a good reminder, the literal reading of the text is not always super helpful because they weren't always writing for the literal meeting to be the primary meeting. That was irony that Paul was writing with there. He meant the exact opposite. So the rhetorical trap for the judge presumes God will judge the Gentiles. It relies on the Torah for its argument boasts in its relation with God, knows the divine will, is instructed in the Torah, is a guide to the blind because the judge is a light in the world's darkness, is a corrector of the foolish, is a teacher of children, and knows the Torah, and so teaches the Torah. So Paul here, again, is describing a means of living within the Christian community by Jewish Christians who adhere fiercely to the principles of the Torah. And again, remember what we're marking out here. We're marking out virtue signaling practices. So things like circumcision, things like observing the Sabbath, things like dietary laws, things that would signal to other people that you have a very different and distinct, thereby superior 
faith to them, those are the primary issues with the ways in which the Jewish Christians are practicing their faith, is by bringing the Torah into it, what they're emphasizing is not the salvation that we receive by grace through faith. Instead, what they're emphasizing is the law as the significant component of faith. And that, Paul says, is the big mistake. And that, Paul says, is what makes them blind, not only to, uh, to, their, to the work of Jesus, but also blind to their own hypocrisy. Because the things that Paul lists there at the end of that uh, are things that, while uh, spoken against in the Torah, uh, are not things that are emphasized by uh, Torah uh, practicing Christians because they're things that, by and large, happen out of sight. So, uh, so here, uh, Paul has laid his trap for the judge and allowed them to walk right into it. He's given them the stereotype of uh, of the recalcitrant um, Gentile. He has then poked them for saying, therefore, do not judge, and then shown them their hypocrisy uh, in how they behave. Questions about this bit? I think this passage is a good example of why reading Romans uh, is so difficult and why also I uh, really don't like pulling out one or two verses of Romans and holding that up as some sort of like theological explanation because uh, Romans has to be read as a unit. This is a good example of that. Okay, on we go. Romans 2, 25 to 29. So circum circumcision is indeed, indeed is a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Thank you, Paul, for this very wordy and somewhat confusing <laughs> sentence. Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you that condemn you that have written the have the written code and circumcision but break the law for a person is not a jew who is one outwardly nor is true circumcision something external and physical rather a person is a jew who is one inwardly and real circumcision is a matter of the heart it is spiritual and not literal such a person receives praise not from others but from god so now we're getting to the real core of Paul's argument against uh, Torah legalism. So Paul relativizes circumcision. Circumcision is fine, but it's not enough. You haven't accomplished anything by being circumcised. Thus, Paul is relativizing circumcision and Jewishness when it comes to the work of God and Christ through the Spirit. But this relativization pertains to life in the mission churches of Paul. The Gentile who believes in Jesus becomes the true Jew for Paul. Circumcision is flesh. Instead of flesh, Paul turns to the heart and to the spirit and to the inner person where genuine confession, repentance, faith, and obedience are to be found. So here we see an occasion where you take kind of the primary issue with following the Torah, which is circumcision, and Paul really attacks it. And so what he does is he says that just circumcising your body doesn't really accomplish anything in terms of adhering to the teachings of the Messiah. What matters is the spiritual circumcision that happens when you have faith, when your heart is changed. So it's important that your heart, your soul be circumcised and not your body. Uh, bodily circumcision here, Paul says, doesn't mean anything. So now, maybe that first sentence will read a little bit smoother to us. Circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law. That's what you think, Jewish Christians, that it's a value if you obey the law. But let me tell you, if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Like, it no longer means anything if you break the law. So if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, Will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So he's turning the argument back against the Jewish Christians. 
And his point here is like, if you have somebody who's uncircumcised, but they're keeping the law, doesn't that count? Haven't they done what needs to be done? If on the one hand, a circumcised person can disobey and therefore have their circumcision rendered irrelevant, doesn't the opposite hold true? So it's a logic argument that Paul is making. So we're going to stop here before we move on to the next section, because this is kind of a lot of stuff, and it's a little bit, I think, confusing. So um, maybe a lot confusing, you tell me. Uh, but anyway, do you have questions? What would you like to say here um, before we move on? Are you totally confused at this point? Yes is an acceptable answer. No is preferred. <laughs> Well, to me, it's kind of like the same argument of the people that, that wear a, a necklace with a cross on, but, mm -hmm. you know, do things that aren't Christian. It's right. just a little less radical. Yeah, I mean, it's the same idea, right? Like you, sometimes, and I, maybe you know people like this, some of the people who are the most showy about their faith are actually some of the least faithful people when you actually drill down that you might care to meet. Um, so I, I think that's very much at the heart of what Paul's getting at. The, the core of all this, and I think the thing to remember, is that primarily what the book of Romans about is about is existing in community as Christians who have uh, differences. That's primarily what the book is about. It happens to be that he's dealing with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, but what you've named, Ken, is a good example of what we deal with uh, in our modern world, in our own life, which is people who sit in the same church but have radically different understandings of what it means to follow Jesus. I mean, that's the issue. Shirley? Well, it seems to me it fits into Paul's overall theme that there's an unrighteous, no, not one, and the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. So it has to come back to the very basis of Christianity, which is faith. That's right. I mean, faith is, is the bottom line for Paul. I mean, McKnight's touched on that numerous times, that saved by grace through faith is the foundation for the whole, the whole undertaking. Everybody has to be on board with that before we can work out anything else. And for us as Christians, that idea of faith is the most important part of our practice. I mean, that's right, Shirley. I mean, it comes back to faith. Absolutely. Anything else you guys want to say before we keep going? So I know this is kind of difficult. I know we're, we're into some hard things. There's just no other way to do Romans than, than this. I mean, it is a hard, difficult book. Uh, and as, as you can tell, there's, there's 12 of you on Zoom and there's six of us here. Uh, you know, I think the first day that we did it in week one, I think there were about 30 of you on Zoom. Oh. So not everybody has the stomach for it, and I don't blame them. It's difficult, but uh, <clears throat> as you can see now, we're, I mean, the shoreline is far out that way, and we're in the deep water. Uh, so it's hard. I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's very difficult, because Paul's assuming a lot, and he's, he's playing a lot of games with his words. So it's hard to just sit down and read it even and have it really flow nicely without having to process almost every word. So back we go. So what is the advantage for the Jews? This is going to get us into chapter three. Oops. Okay. So what is the advantage? So this is, let's talk about the issue before we read the stuff. Inherent to Israel's story and to the identity formation of observant Jews was a sense of election and advantage. Thus we read in Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9, when the Most High apportioned the nations, when he divided humankind, he fixed the boundaries of people according to the numbers of the gods. The Lord's own portion was his people, Jacob his allotted share. So that's Deuteronomy. So again, we're in, we're in the Torah in the first five books of the Bible. And that's where God's like, these are my people. So within that, that you would think there's a specific feeling of advantage, right? We're the ones that God picked from way back when. It is this election and advantage that every Torah observant Jew thought the Gentile mission apostle 
was calling into question. If anybody can be a part of this, then what does it mean that Jewish folks are God's people? If anybody can be a part of it, that calls into question their whole worldview. When Paul asks the advantage question in chapters three and four, he's bringing to the service to the surface the question asked in every Christian community that had Jewish Christians in it. So what about this? We've touched about it on it already. Remember at the end, we're going to come back to the to chapters nine through 11. Uh, we've already covered those where it talks about the root of the tree and it talks about the remnant and all that stuff. So a lot of Romans is spent on this issue. So I know you're excited. I can feel it. Let's see how Paul answers the question. Oh, wait, Flex, I have a question. I see a hand. Proceed, Flex. So I just, I can't, uh, I can't let it slip past. What gods are we talking about? Okay. Well, what gods are we talking about? We're talking about the pantheon of gods that exist in the world. Because when Deuteronomy was written, the assumption was that there were multiple gods and that the Jewish folks were the choice of one God. And that is the true God. So while we live in a day where we would not phrase things that way, we think there's one God and that pretty well wraps it up. Way, way back in the old, old times, old times when Deuteronomy was written, uh, the assumption was that, uh, that there were other gods, but you can see that they are subservient to the God of the Jewish folks. And remember, I don't really say the name, so I'm not saying the name. Um, but it's, you can see Lord is all capitalized. So that's Jehovah that we're talking about. Um, so read it again. When the Most High apportioned the nations, he divided humankind and he fixed the boundaries of people according to the numbers of the gods. The Lord's own portion was his people, Jacob, his allotted share. So the top, tippity top God chose the Israelites and then gave the other crummy gods all the crummy people. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're to read there so it assumes the existence of other gods but they are weaker than the hebrew god so a follow on to that then because we talk about god's impartiality yep clearly he's he's taken the crummy people that doesn't sound so impartial and given them to the crummy gods right well that's the shift in the worldview right like, so that's the change that happens through Jesus. So remember the tree, right? So you've got this tree, the roots of the tree, the roots of the olive tree are God. That's the root. And you've got this tree and the tree is full. But God comes along and chops off a few branches, reaches out, grafts on some other branches, and then you have a new tree. So the idea is in Jesus, you shift from one perfectly chosen group of people and a bunch of crummy people to everybody is welcome. It's a fundamental shift. That's why it's so jarring because forever, forever and ever and ever, the things that Jewish people had going for them when they were conquered, when they were suffering, when things were difficult, what they had going for them was that self-identity as the chosen people of the most high God. That didn't change. Now, in Jesus, according to Paul, that very identity is changing. And now, the Most High God is welcoming all the nations into this new thing. And further, doing it temporarily at the expense of some of the Jewish people. So, the, so you are you are correctly naming the very pun intended root of the problem with that question, and the Deuteronomy passage is one of many that highlights the worldview that was so heavily disrupted. I can give you a perfect example of this. We're not going to discuss it because it's political, but I think it's the perfect example. It's the same idea. The same jarring idea we would have if we just said anybody could come live in America, 
right? Like if we just said, you know, for, for 200 years, by and large, we've said, well, some people can come, but not everybody can come. And we've kind of limited it. And sometimes we let more in and sometimes we let less in, but always we say, you know, there's a line. Then all of a sudden, one day something happens and there's no line and everybody can come in. We would have like everybody who grew up here and who has lived here for a long time would be like, what is happening? I think, I don't know this because we never have conversations like this in our, oh wait, we do. Um, <laughs> but it's, and I, I'm not making a value judgment around that. What I'm trying to get at there is that issue of identity. Who are we? Like if who we are is Americans and then anybody can be an American, what's it mean then to say that I'm an American? The same thing's happening here. If what I am is a Jew, and that means that I'm a child of the most high God, and then I find out anybody can be a child of the most high God simply by believing in this Judean guy over here, not Greg, the guy over there. You, you see the, the problem. Even if I believe in him, even if I think he's the Messiah, it's still jarring. What about my identity that I've had for generations? That's the problem. So great question, Peter. That's a really good question. Now, we can have another long conversation about whether or not this means that the Bible is telling us that there's other gods uh, and just uh, one above them. But I don't want to talk about that really today. Maybe another time. Follow-up questions to that? Okay. Let's see what he says to them. It's pretty long, so I'll read it kind of slowly. There's lots of Old Testament quotes in here, which everybody always loves. So let's get right to it. What advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. For in the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. That's great. What if some were unfaithful? Will their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Although everyone is a liar, let God be proved true as it is written, so that you may be judged in your words and prevail in your judging. But if our injustice serves to confirm the justice of God, what should we say? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then, how could ju God judge the world? But if through my falsehood, God's truthfulness abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not say, as some people slander us by saying that we say, let us do evil so that good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. What then? Are we any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. As it is written, here comes a lot of Old Testament for you. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Their throats are opened graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. The mouth, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be judged in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law, here comes the money line, comes the knowledge of sin. Okay, everybody got it? Do I need to explain it? I think it's pretty clear. That was irony. <laughs> So, is there an advantage to Jewishness? Paul concedes the advantage. These are almost all these are McKnight's quotes, just so you know, because this is not language I use. But he pulls the slack tight. How so? God's judgment of the oracle possessing weak is the same 
as his judgment of the Gentile strong. What matters is works, not elective privilege or Torah possession. Paul teaches that failure to observe the Torah brings both God's holiness and faithfulness into sharper focus. Some claim that Paul was then sitting loose with respect to Torah observance. But this is absurd, for Paul knows that human sinfulness can be overcome through the power of God's Spirit and lead to righteousness, love, peace, wisdom, and holiness, even if not through Torah observance. So, the more unfaithful God's people are, the more it makes obvious the fidelity of God, because God, one, doesn't completely toss them overboard, but two, does discipline. So, works of the law. Works of the law describes the faithful Jews' consistent observance of the Torah. Still, there's more work, since the focus of this expression in Pauline contexts um, is on singular and identity-shaping laws like the Sabbath, food laws, and circumcision. And so it is reasonable to see works of the law as acts that are boundary-marking and evocative of election, election and privilege, and that can generate boasting. Okay, so that's how we're describing works of the law here. These are ones that lead to boasting. In the history of theology, works of the law has been laid into a network the doctrine of salvation. Now, this is what I mean by McKnight's going to stray here from systematic theology. And in that network, it describes proud humans who are merit-seeking before God. It has been argued that works of the law describes Jewish self-righteousness, and thus that Judaism became a religion. Oh, man, I missed a typo. Ann Lynn's here. That's going to make it worse for me. There we go. In which humans sought salvation by works. However, the substance of Romans 1.18 to 3.20 is not aimed at universal attempts to prove one's merit before God, and neither is their emphasis in these verses on Gentiles. The focus is, again, on those who are under the law. In context, then, works of the law is far closer to boundary-marking behaviors than to merit-seeking universal human attempts to prove oneself. I'm going to read one more slide, and then we'll talk about that, because McKnight's making a claim. Actually, I'm going to talk about it now, because that's the end. I have a question. Yeah, Travis. Who is McKnight? He's the author of the book we're using. Oh, sorry, good question. Scott McKnight. Hold up your book, Greg. There it is. I mean, Greg and I are the only ones reading it. <laughs> so, anyway, okay, so this is important. We hear, we hear it say all the time, right? You're saved by faith and not works. You've heard that before. You don't earn your way into heaven, right? Have you heard that? Yes. Okay, so what McKnight's saying here is that at least in this part of Romans, what Paul's arguing when he says that we are saved by faith and not works is not this modern idea of what we think of when we think of theology. What he's thinking of specifically is we are saved by faith, not by boundary-marking Torah adherence. So, for the Jews, what they thought was that by doing these very clear boundary-marking Torah obedience actions, Sabbath, dietary laws, circumcision, that they were marking out their salvation with their behavior. It makes a lot of sense. If you think that you are the chosen people of God, then the most important behaviors are going to be those that kind of signal to everyone else that you've been set aside. So that's, that makes sense. So what McKnight's saying here, though, is that those don't do anything for you. So he's not, so what, Rome, what Paul's doing is not attacking this idea that Christians earn their way into heaven by being good. What he's attacking is that Jewish Christians earned their way into heaven by observing boundary-marking Torah law behaviors. That's a, that's, a, that's a distinction. So he's narrowing down significantly the scope of that phrase, works of the law. 
he's he's bringing it McKnight is is making it real small so that would leave that would change in some key ways uh our theology i don't think mcknight would make that argument but anyway that that could be made uh anyway so that's a that's a key difference that you're getting from these passages you can go back and read them really slowly if you want to um but the gist of what we just read was this idea that uh that God remains faithful and remains righteous even when God's people are unfaithful and unrighteous. That was the gist of that particular passage. And then to transition us away from this idea of salvation being earned by works of the law. So it's a key, it's a key shift. So you have questions about that? Did any of it make sense? Just use your fingers like this and if you want to. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. Okay. There is a statement in the text. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. This says, yes, the Jews have an advantage, but their unfaithfulness nullifies that advantage. Yes. I have a hard time with that. Okay, proceed. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, I think it, the question is, the Jews were special chosen people. Mm -hmm. We can acknowledge that. We are taught that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not about trying to equalize with the Jews, but it is to sort of call them out, <laughs> which is the New Testament message. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I don't necessarily have a hard time with it, but I think it's a Maybe it's just an almost like an unknown concept within the church almost. I don't know. Not well, entirely, it's but. a it's a first century concept. Right. Because by by the time those first Jewish Christians kids were dead, then all of this had been baked into the church. So, you know, by this by the two hundreds, you're no longer having these types of conversations. Um so it, it, I think it's very much a first century problem that we get uh, and not, and so for the Old Testament, yes, like today we would say that clearly for a long time in a very dark world, Jewish people carried the torch and then that changed with Jesus. That's, that would kind of be our, and by our, I mean like Christianity's modern take on that. Yeah. So it would still hold high, should hold high the place of the Jewish people, should. But there, there's nothing here. I mean, maybe there is a lot here. I don't know if I saw this. Or, but if we were to want to choose to have a conversation, which I've actually had a couple with, mm -hmm. a, a um, traditional, adhering to tradition, Jewish person, uh, that conversation is something that I don't know. I think it might be difficult because they're not, they're not, they're, they're have their identity, as you say, mm -hmm. is to be a traditional Jewish heritage, ethnicity, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this is not a part of any of that discussion. Not a part of the discussion at all. Not unless they start coming to church with you. Right, exactly. Which I don't think their family would appreciate. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, not a part of that right. conversation at all. Now, I mean, and even the stuff like Romans 9 to 11, which gets into remnant issues and that sort of thing, that's inside baseball to Jewish people. They don't care. I mean, just don't yeah. bother them. <laughs> Look, right. You take your fake Messiah and go sit in your building and yeah. you could be fine and we'll stay over here and be the, the you know. So I think it's Jacob. very important to understand that this discussion in Romans mm -hmm. is not about that. It's not about that. You're yeah. correct in naming that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But that's not always clear. No, and it's mm -hmm. it it and it, you can win points by muddying it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, and again, don't take Romans 9 to 11 and try to build a theology of how to interact with modern Jewish people out of it. Like this is the problem. This is the whole problem with how Romans and then scripture in general is taken. Like, we're going to lift out two chapters, three chapters of this, and somehow make that 
about something that it has no interest in discussing, really. And, and so you, you just can't do it without taking into account the full breadth of Romans. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. But yet, yes, people love to do that kind of stuff. So, okay, I got to go to the outdoor worship service now. My second worship service of the day. Great. All right, see you next week. Bye, everybody.